I do want women to know that there is an alternative to suppressing their bodies with hormones, that they can see their body as a good and they can live in that body holistically. Totally. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Join co-hosts Jamie Rauchy and Teresa Kenny as they educate women about the beauty of the feminine design and empower women to take charge of their health. They're going to be so amazing. You're going to be so empowered by understanding your feminine genius and your hormone genius. I don't think I can live my whole life knowing this and not sharing it with anyone. Hi, this is Teresa Kenny from the Hormone Genius Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Jamie Rachi, and we are together today to do a fantastic episode that is going to give an overview of fertility awareness-based methods, otherwise known as natural family planning, so that you know what your options are. And this is a lot of content. Um, it's very exciting because the world of natural fertility has exploded in so many ways, but there is still kind of this foundation of really um, structured methods that we really want to go through so that you know what your options are and you feel confident about choosing what's best for you. It's such an important topic. And I've said this a few times, but when I was in college, I wanted to learn more about the different systems. And so granted that was over 10 years ago, but I learned that it's not just one thing. You know, when people say, oh, I'm going to use natural family planning or I'm going to use a fertility tracking system that doesn't point to just one thing. It's actually several things. When I say things, I mean several methods. There's many ways to practice tracking your cycle because there are many ways to look at your body and know when it's fertile. And so that was one thing that I learned as I was doing my own research as a master's student that totally struck me. I thought, what? It's not just the temperature, which is what I had always learned, you know, that your temperature shifts and, and that didn't seem right because, you know, there are so many things that might affect my temperature. So no wonder people think natural systems don't work well because your temperature can be kind of wonky. If you had wine the night before or cold medicine, or you, you know, slept strange or whatever. So we're really excited to dig in to this topic with you all, because there are so many options for you and based on the season in your life and based on your goals might, um, gear you toward a specific method. So today, again, we're going to be talking about some of the more popular, uh, methods out there. We're going to explain just high level what, um, these systems basically, you know, like the, the main, the main method or the main how to with some of these systems. Um, and yeah, we'll just have a conversation back and forth. But again, for those of you who are confused by this or think it's one thing, and you think if you use a natural system, you're going to get pregnant and you're trying not to just know you might not have the system. You might be, might not be practicing the, the right system in the right season if you're nervous. So just know there are options. Yeah, absolutely. And Um, you know, basically, you know, it always gets that back to a foundation, Jamie, for us of this is about understanding, um, our bodies. It's about the knowledge, the education, the empowerment that comes from understanding as a woman, how our menstrual cycles work Mm -hmm. and how we can be in tune to that, which of course relates to our ability to have babies and not have babies but it also relates to health as well. And that's why you say, you know, this is about what, where you're at in your life. It, you know, some people's goals for tracking their, their body and their cycle are completely different, but no matter what, how you track, it's all going to be the same. Why? Because biology is always the same. So we want to, you know, start with just the very basics of this is how we look at biological markers of fertility and how you track them. So you could kind of break up cycle tracking into different methods by biological markers. Mm-hmm. So we'll start with the cervical fluid maybe, or the um, methods that use cervical mucus as tracking and just explain kind of how that works and what methods are the most common for that. So do you want to get us started on that, Jamie? Yeah. Yeah. So there are several mucus methods. So just like I said, there are many fertility awareness systems, like high level. There are 
um, cervical fluid methods, just like Teresa said. And then there's also methods, just high level, so you know what you're getting into here with this episode. There's also symptothermal, symptohormonal, calendar, lactation methods. So this is the first one we're going to dig into, the cervical fluid. So within the cervical fluid like umbrella, um, typically, you know, you all know probably by this point that we treat both Teresa and I are trained in the Creighton method. And so that is one that both, um, Teresa and I have strong familiarity with, um, also billings, the billings method and the Creighton method are very similar. And let's face it, all of these have that component of mucus. So again, as much as Teresa and I can, we'll try to kind of pinpoint what the differences are. Um, FEM uses cervical fluid, the two day method, and there's um, family of Americas, which I can say I'm probably least familiar with. I do have familiarity um, with Creighton, Billings, FEM, and two day. So we can kind of talk a little bit about what those differences are. So let's start Teresa with Creighton since it's the one we know um, most often. Uh, Teresa, would you say, Let's have this question I want to ask you here. Um, when women come into you and they are new women, like new patients, would you say that yeah. these women are coming to you because of the Creighton system in general, or is it because they've heard that you don't prescribe birth control? And what does that first appointment look like when you're trying to explain to that woman, you know, her options and more specifically Creighton? Like, how does that conversation begin and how does that woman respond to this basic information that she may be, have never been told. Yeah. I mean, I think almost exclusively most of my appointments, when women come in, they do not come in saying, I would like to learn about the Creighton model system or the billions ovulation method. They come in because like you said, they're interested in learning about their health for some reason. Maybe it's a problem that they're having. Maybe it's infertility. Maybe, maybe they don't even know they're looking for the information. Maybe they're young and, and, you know, we just have that conversation in terms of education about their cycle. So at that point, you know, you, we start to dive into, okay, well, if you're going to learn how to cycle track, what are your options, you know? And I think we can tie Billings and Creighton model really together because the Creighton model system is actually built on the Billings ovulation method. So the Billings ovulation method was introduced by Dr. John and Lynn Billings, and they were Australian physicians, and they devised a system to track mucus, but it's a, what we call subjective mucus system. So it's based on a woman's ability to assess sensation and wetness and kind of how it feels on a daily basis um, at the, at the opening of the vulva crate model took that and billings is great. It's very easy. It's, um, you know, taught very standardly, very systematically. It's very effective. Crate model was built off of that. And Dr. Thomas Hilgers of Omaha, Nebraska took the billings method and basically standardized it in a different way to the point where he made mucus objective and quantifiable and gave it almost a language you could say for a woman to describe it. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very standardized system in that way of tracking mucus on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So what that looks like is just that, you know, first day of your period, you know, you mark your bleeding days at the end of the days, when they become light, you start to track mucus mm -hmm. every time you're in the bathroom and you have a way of basically creating a language around you know, tracking that mucus, you can identify the fertile window very accurately because mucus changes, of course, with the cycle, as we've talked about on this podcast many times. And once the mucus and fertile window closes, your mucus dries up again. Mm -hmm. So those two are very kind of tied together. I feel like totally. And it's so cool because what, um, Teresa, you just mentioned is one thing that I really love about Creighton is the standardization of the observations. Um, while I do like that Billings idea, and again, it just depends on, you know, your reason and season in life in terms of what method you choose. I like um, Billings, their idea that women kind of sometimes just intuitively know based on how they feel. I like that part that they're tapping into that like feminine understanding of our body you know, it almost teaches you to understand it more. What is it trying to tell us? I like that idea, but for people who are more data-driven, I like Creighton in that, you know, these, um, observations, they mean something 
they mean something and not all cervical mucus may actually, well, I should say not all discharge is cervical mucus. And so that's another difference that as a Creighton practitioner, you really begin to understand and learn and know like what sort of discharges may, you know, maybe even be cause for concern where they need to be referred to a a medical doctor. So I always tell people, I'm like, I could look at a chart from a woman in China and not speak Chinese, but know what her cycle is like based on the standard understanding, the standardized um, observations that we make. So anyway, I love that about Creighton. And I think a lot of people who are data-driven and research-driven can see and understand why that's important when collecting data. So yes, that's what I love about about Creighton. So, okay. So there's Creighton. We talk about billings. Now let's talk about FEM. Mm -hmm. So FEM, I feel like is kind of raising, um, in its popularity. I do know that as far as this point in time, um, the studies and the effectiveness studies with FEM, while I know that the, the research points to the direction of it being very effective, I think that they're still, um, somewhat new in that they're still gathering that data. Uh, what I like about FEM is the cute app that goes with FEM. So it is based on cervical mucus, but they do tie in LH strips, um, LH strips. And then also you can tie temperature into it too. So it's, it, it gives you the tools, but they're primarily based on the cervical mucus. I would say though, that the instruction or the quote unquote rules, um, are more, um, I'd say confining. So after learning Creighton and after learning FEM myself, there are more days, um, of infertility with Creighton, where if you and your husband are, you know, trying to plan intercourse, there are, there are more times you can do that with Creighton than you could with FEM. So that's just another thing to think about. But I do like how FEM is more geared toward like the millennial. It's a cute app. It tracks other things like your emotions and the way you feel um, and that kind of thing. So yeah. I have a lot of my college students that have happened upon FEM and, and they're using that. And I would say it's definitely marketed a little bit more towards health and not yep. for family planning. I think the the market there is to drive young people to learn their body and to chart. Although I think they can kind of give instruction for family planning at some point, but yep. yeah. I, and I always kind of give a caveat because they haven't done studies on FEM for family planning. They mm. have used kind of you know, Creighton model and billings and other people's data to show this works the same because it is the same. We're tracking the same, right. but a caveat in that, but both FEM and Creighton model are similar because they both have devised kind of a way to medically manage women's health problems with those charting systems specifically. Mm -hmm. And Creighton model is attached to NAPRO technology and FEM is attached to something called FEM medical management. And both have additional educational programs for, um, doctors, uh, providers of healthcare so that they can learn how to do those medical mm -hmm. management. And yeah. that is very, very, very useful, obviously. And something that I use in my practice all the time. All right. Let's talk about the next section. So we went through the cervical fluid methods. Um, let's talk about, uh, symptothermal. Let's talk about the sympt symptothermal methods, Teresa. Um, which one do you want to talk about first? Well, I mean, uh, I think couple to couple league is kind of a, a you know, well-known one. Um, I have a lot of clients, patients that have used couple to couple league. Um, they, you know, have a, a ability to, um, look for cervical mucus, but temperature is kind of the foundation still it's based on tracking basal body temperature right away in the morning before you get out of bed, before you drink, before you pee, before you do anything. And the science around basal body temperature is very good. And it's been around for 35 plus years. So, you know, even now we've got the Apple watch is using basal body temperature and women and tracking. So that technology is very solid and many systems have been developed out of tracking temperature. Um, but a lot of people combine, you know, different mm -hmm. biological markers to help women understand, you know, things better. So I think that's, what's cool about it is with the couple to couple league, you're using temperature, cervical mucus awareness. They even have an ability to check the cervix, um, you know, to literally feel the cervix and to know mm -hmm. the changes of the cervix, you know, through the cycle. And I think that's the one where sometimes people are like, ah, maybe not for me always, but you know, that's really getting in touch with your body. And, and it could be great for some people to use that as well. Yeah. My husband and I used it early on in our marriage. Um, and we were getting trained in the couple, the couple league, um, system. And so, 
uh, yes, what I like about it is for those of you who are just so fascinated about your body and what your body's telling you, it's so cool to see all the like inner tangles of what your body is telling you in terms of its fertility. Um, so just as a little FYI, so as you progress throughout your cycle, we know, okay, we have our period and then typically it's a number of days that are dry. And so, um, but not always, but let's just say for this example, um, and we just talked about cervical mucus methods, right? So about mid cycle, but it, it varies and it ranges, a woman starts to notice some like characteristic type of discharge. It could be sticky, you know, it could be yellow, pasty, cloudy, you know, and then it starts to loosen up, um, throughout the cycle where it's stretchy, clear, lubricative. And as it's getting more that way, like more abundant in like slip and slide sort of egg white central, um, that's when we're getting closer to ovulation. And then most women notice a huge shift downward, kind of like I was trying to explain with the two day method. Like you notice like there's a bunch and then there's a little, or there's a bunch and then there's none. Mm -hmm. And then that day where there's a bunch, and again, you want to work with a practitioner on this, that day where there's a ton, um, typically, you know, we closely associate that with ovulation. All right. But when that's happening, so you're noticing this mucus, um, buildup, but after you ovulate, what happens is you notice a temperature increase because when, you ovulate after you've ovulated the hormone progesterone is your main, like your dominant hormone should be. So that progesterone creates a higher temperature in a woman. And so that's kind of a sign that you've ovulated. Um, and you need three days in a row of a temperature, at least of, um, 0.4, I believe 0.3 or 0.4, um, higher than the days prior. So there's more to it than that. And you'll want to work with somebody to get that. Um, but it's just so cool to see that. And also what happens is, um, Teresa mentioned that you can check your cervix. So your cervix, your cervical position and the, the firmness or softness of your cervix also gives us information about our fertility. So when our cervix is soft and open and higher, that's a sign of fertility. Um, when it's low and hard and closed. When I say closed, there's a cervical canal, like an opening there. You can tell it's kind of like, um, like the texture or the, the, um, feel of like what your nose would feel like. It's kind of like that kind of feeling. And almost, I think of like a mini donut with like, you know, those donuts, mm -hmm. that's like what your cervix is like. So you'll feel like it's open or it's closed. So we call that the biological valve, but some people check for that. Um, so that's, uh, kind of overview of like the symptom um, method, symptothermal methods is a combination of those things. Yeah. So main point, progesterone happens only after ovulation and progesterone is thermogenic and mm -hmm. it's a retrospective thing. So it's not, you know, temperature is, is going to tell you that something already passed because yeah. it, you know, as it raises. Mm -hmm. So, um, I like to refer to it as a retrospective kind of biological marker. The cool yeah. thing is, is if you thought you were pregnant, and you didn't want to do a pregnancy test. You could actually know you were pregnant if you've missed your period by just taking your body temperature, mm -hmm. because in pregnancy, your body temperature will stay above 98.1 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so, and I've, I've tried that a couple of times when mm -hmm. I was pregnant just to kind of check it. And because right before your period, your temperature will drop back down and that signals the loss of your progesterone and your period, you know, will start. So kind of a cool, so cool little tip there. So and it's it, waking temperature too. So someone might hear you say 98, one and think what 98, six is the temperature is like the normal. So waking temperature, you're always a little less warm. Well, and 98, six always drives me crazy, you know, because everybody thinks that's like the normal body temperature. And even honestly, like not just waking, most people's body temperature does not stay at 98.6. It's usually <laughs> below 98. So if you take your body temperature and it's 97.5, 97, that's typical. Yeah. But again, after ovulation, it does usually go above 98.1. All right. So Marquette method, mm -hmm. this is a really fun, popular, I feel like method, um, that a lot of my patients use and it has kind of special benefits. I feel like in the postpartum period and even for perimenopause. So I haven't used Marquette myself, but like I said, I have a lot of patients that have used it. Yes. So yeah, Marquette is a system where, 
I know the mucus is tracked, but you're also um, utilizing a clear blue monitor where it's checking your LH. Um, I'm sure you could probably use LH strips too, but I know that they use the clear blue monitor. Um, if you remember when we were talking about cervical mucus, we talked about FEM and FEM is using mucus, but it's also even using LH strips. So you're going to see some interweave between all of these. And that's why at the very beginning of the episode, Teresa, and I said, well, you might decide, you know, to switch around. So if you do switch around, you'll know maybe already half of the new system because you learned it from another one, although there may be differences. So Marquette is wonderful. Um, a lot of people who get frustrated with tracking their cycle, like let's say on paper chart with Creighton or Billings or whatever, so even symptothermal, if they've had a baby, um, Marquette seems to be a really great system for people who are nervous about maybe getting pregnant again after having a child postpartum, the postpartum time. So I hear that a lot, that a lot of Marquette instructors are busy with women who are breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that too, Teresa? Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 So there are instructors, the Marquette instructors need to be nurses, um, which I think is really cool as well, because talk about like shaking up the hospital system. You know, if there's a bunch of nurses that want to get trained or if there's a doctor who'd be willing to work with these, I mean, that, that like gets injected into the hospital system, hopefully. So if those of you listening are a nurse and you want to learn more, um, Marquette is a great system and it might even, you know, perk some interest, um, for your fellow nurses or others in the hospital that have some, you know, same convictions as you. Yeah. And so, I love, I love that Marquette continually does research and, um, you can find, um, a lot of their research online. Dr. Richard Farring was, um, the original developer and he just continues to provide more research into the current medical literature, which gives credence to, again, the effectiveness, the value of these systems for, for all women and for families out there. So that's mm -hmm. great. Um, what else can we say about Marquette? You know, I think, you know, my, again, my patients find it easy. Men seem to like it because of the data. I think the, the data that comes from a machine also is kind of helpful. I think men kind of can wrap their brains around it. So I've seen that happen as well. Mm -hmm. And it is a little bit more cost cumbersome for some. So that can be a downside just because it is an expense up front to buy the monitor and you have to continually buy the strips as well. And for some women, you know, they're going to use 10 days of strips and for another woman might use 15 to 20 strips per month. So mm -hmm. there can be some variation in that as well, mm -hmm. but they have great instruction. Like you said, Jamie, and there's a lot of information online about Marquette. And if you're on the cusp, if you're listening and you're on the cusp because you are so frustrated, maybe with the system you've been using, um, it seems like the people I've worked with who just need one more thing, like in terms of feeling comfortable about their fertile window, especially for them trying to actively avoid, it seems like Marquette just really helps them too, um, with having that comfort. I would say Marquette is like, I would say a VIP for those who are actively trying to avoid pregnancy. I see that being one of the more popular reasons it's being used. I wouldn't maybe necessarily just personally point them in the direction of Marquette. If I know that there is a health or underlying condition where there may be like the need of surgery, let's just say. So, um, if somebody's really struggling, I would want to to know that they would be able to get connected with a doctor trained, um, in a fertility awareness system and even like a surgeon, like net with NAPRO technology. So, um, that's kind of how I think of it is NAPRO technology is like really great for the surgery need. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah. you say? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. NAPRO technology, again, doctors are very specifically trained and it is attached to the Creighton model system. So there's just an additional benefit of getting, you know, extra support and care and possible, you know, doctors who have been trained in surgery when you chart the Creighton model system. And I agree, you know, for my patients who have infertility and issues with tremendous amounts of pain, ovarian cysts, anything really, really intense with women's health, I, I genuinely steer them towards great model. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just kind of a good way to think of it. All right. And then lastly, um, before we talk, um, about maybe what's to come on the horizon for tracking your fertility cycle, um, is your, the lactation methods. So we've all heard, right. Teresa of people who are like, what, I thought I wasn't supposed to get pregnant when I was breastfeeding, but here I am, you know, 
pregnant postpartum four months or whatever. Um, so, so we call it, um, ecological breastfeeding or lactational amenorrhea. And that's the idea that when you breastfeed, and again, it makes sense. It totally makes sense. But when you breastfeed, um, there is a hormone that's released. It's called prolactin prolactin prolactate and that's supposed to suppress um the work of your ovaries it's supposed to suppress all that and so what's again supposed to happen is the more you breastfeed the more prolactin is released and then the less likely you'll ovulate but what happens is when women like you know go back to work or or just some women just some women are different where maybe there isn't as much prolactin being signaled or maybe they're they're not their baby sleeping through the night or whatever the case is, but it really just has to happen once where there's a span of time, you know, a four to six hour chunk of time, let's say, you know, a couple months postpartum or beyond where it can trip, you know, your ovarian function, the prolactin can dip down enough where then your ovarian, your ovaries start, start picking up. So I think of, um, myself, and I don't know, Teresa, like for you, I think you, I don't know if, how much you breastfed, but for me, I got my period four months postpartum with almost all of my kids. And like, they varied on like how often I breastfed and if I pumped and it varies basically. So I wouldn't yeah. say that that's a super effective way to avoid pregnancy. It might be a perk for some where they say, oh, it looks like I'm not noticing cervical mucus. I'm really not. I'm not noticing any sign of fertility and I'm breastfeeding. That makes sense. But for some others, I would say partner with a, an instructor, maybe especially in Marquette. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's probably different globally than it is maybe for, you know, yeah. uh, you know, Western women, just because I think our lives are a lot more crazy, you know, yeah. in terms of like uh, pumping and working and raising kids and being all over the place. So that may make a difference rather than kind of the traditional ecological breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of women that can use this effectively and you kind of have to know yourself and know your body that literally it doesn't kind of, they can breastfeed minimally and they still keep their periods yeah. away. I think it's good to know that you can ovulate before your first period postpartum. That's always just a standard thing I always share. So that's why it's important to, I think, have another way to track the biological markers and mucus tracking is an easy one to do so that you can, you know, see that your fertility is a possibility. Mm-hmm. And, um, so this is, um, uh, the caveat of all of these things that we're talking about today is that, you know, we really believe that working with an instructor is incredibly important and helpful, especially when it comes to using these systems to avoid pregnancy, because you need the individual instruction to be able to understand your own body and people who have been trained in these methods, their job is to help you with that. And they have been, you know, highly trained in these systems. Mm -hmm. So please get an instructor. And if you don't know where to start, you know, we interviewed, um, Bridget Busacker who started the managing your fertility.com is a great resource or fabmbase.org is a great resource in terms of just getting, uh, you know, an overview of all the systems and like plug in your address and you can find a teacher in your area. So we just really encourage that. Yeah, totally. Yep. Um, and then let's, pivot Teresa into some femtech convo. So those ladies who are listening, you might be thinking, well, I don't use any of the systems that Teresa and Jamie are talking about. I use my phone. You know, I use just an app on my phone, whether it's the flow app or whatever. I don't, I don't know all the, all the names of all the uh, apps. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about just what you need to be aware of with those. And then, um, we'll talk about a little bit like of some monitors. I'm doing an experiment and I want to tell you guys about it (laughs) here at the end. Um, but first let's talk about the apps, Teresa, like, what would you say? What's your general opinion of the apps? Yeah. I mean, my general opinion is that I think it's great that we have access to apps that we can track and learn our bodies. My general Mm -hmm. opinion is it a super positive. Mm -hmm. Um, I read just, you know, this morning that menstrual tracking apps are the fourth most popular app for adult women Mm -hmm. and the second most popular app for teens. Oh my gosh. So That's awesome. It's it's really, really a big deal. And I also read that in 2025, the femtech industry, which is just all of this that relates to anything that's technology that tracks your cycle or gives you information about fertility, or it might have to do with health tracking is a $50 billion industry. 
So there's a lot of people like interested uh, financially in this area, but it is a positive because it is going to continue to uh, get better basically. Yeah. But whenever I talk to a, a, a young woman, an adult woman who's using an app, I always ask the question, does I'll say, um, can you tell me when you ovulate based on your tracking your app? And if she turns to her phone and she says, yes, it tells me I'm going to ovulate here. Then I always have to do a, you know, er, you know, let's, let's, let's reeducate here because again, a lot of people think truly that the app itself is predicting ovulation. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Duane's organization, Marguerite Duane, Dr. Marguerite Duane, who started facts, fertility, um, appreciation, collaboration team to teach the sciences has a study done in 2000, I think at 15 or 16 on all the apps that were available at that time, which now there's probably a hundred more mm -hmm. to see which ones actually target the fertile window correctly. So you can get access to that study. In fact, we'll link it in our little show note um, so that, you know, if you're using an app that is actually predicting the fertile window or not. Now you can, you know, use these um, and you can probably add your information about cervical mucus and things like that. But it, you know, the app itself doesn't predict anything. Right. Exactly. And so, yes, it's so cool that women are wanting to get to know more about their body. You know, what are, what's their mood like? How do these things shift as they progress throughout their cycle, their mucus, their period, all of that. But it is very, very true. I would say, and it's, it's this idea of, you know, wanting to honor our body and the beauty and understanding that our biological markers can actually give us effectively. And my fear is that people will have um, an ill experience with trying to avoid pregnancy using an app alone and giving it a bad name in a sense of it doesn't work. So that's always my hesitation is they're so amazing. They're so great. But if you're actively trying to avoid pregnancy, please meet with somebody because, you know, Teresa, I think you've said this before, like you can't pee on your phone. I mean, you could, but your phone's not going to like tell you, but guess what though? I'm going to talk to you about how you can pee on a strip and put it in a little thingamajig and put it on your phone, which is going to lead me to sharing with our listeners the experiment I'm doing. How about that? Do you have anything else you want to share about apps? Okay. All right. So guys, listen, I was on Instagram and of course, you know how like social media picks up on your search history, yada, yada. So it's always like throwing stuff at me about like fertility and monitors and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, there's this one thing. I'm like, no, how can this be? It tracks your estrogen, your LH, your progesterone, and your FSH beta. They're doing a beta on that one. Okay, so here's the thing. With LH, that's the Marquette method, right? And like FEM, you can do LH strips. The estrogen, I don't know if Marquette, do, do, I don't think so. Does anybody, does anybody know? Do you know? Does I thought, I, I no, I think Marquette, they test estrogen and LH because again, okay. it's picking up the rise in estrogen and the LH peak. Okay. So you have to really have both. Otherwise you're only going to pick up the 24 hour peak, which yes. that wouldn't be effective. Right. So the thing I love about this, it's called a NITO, I N I T O a NITO. And I do have a code, Jamie 15, truly. I hadn't even used it yet. And I'm like, can I get a code? Because this is going to change the world because it checks your progesterone. And so I'm telling you now, guys, I'm only on like day seven of testing this. I'm only on day seven. I have no idea. So if you want to try it, go for it. It's $149. If it's 15 off, it's 120 something. I don't know. But I cannot say like, I'll have to report back and be like, oh, this is how it's going for me. But so far it is testing my levels. I'm at peak fertility right now. And that definitely corresponds with my cervical mucus. What I'm most excited about is the progesterone readings because there is something called the prove strips or tests P R O O V. And I was pumped because it tests. Um, if you've ovulated, it checks for progesterone and for people who are actively trying to avoid pregnancy, that progesterone, just knowing that exists is so helpful because if your progesterone is at what level is it, Teresa, do you know? 3.1. 
3.1 or above, mm -hmm. it means you have ovulated. So for those who have serious reason to avoid and you cannot get pregnant, but you don't want to be on the pill and yada, yada, that's how you know. So it is checking urine. It's not checking the blood, obviously. So it does track that. And then also it tracks your progesterone, I believe, as you um, finish throughout the cycle to know if your progesterone is lower, you know, like it tracks and it plots it. So it really is a pee strip that you put in a little thingamajigger that you hook to your phone and it's connected to an app and you see the hormone levels plotted on an app. <laughs> and so far it's cool. It's, it's lining up with what I'm seeing, which makes sense. But Teresa, I wanted to share that with you. No, it's amazing. And I know, I mean, this is just like, again, things are just coming together. You yeah. Say, right. I mean, we had pieces and people were putting the pieces together and yeah. it seems like finally, like there are now companies are like, no, why aren't we putting this all together? Like, why can't we monitor the cycle from start to finish yeah. hormonally instead of just a piece of the cycle? Mm -hmm. So I know Mira is another one that also does those for, um, tracking, um, for the urine strips too. So this is only going to be new and, um, better improved over time. But like I said, the caveat Jamie and I make is that, you know, this is new. It's not quite fully researched in terms of especially mm -hmm. avoiding pregnancy. So we yeah. always have to remember that, mm -hmm. but there's such great news in the femtech world, um, that people really care about this and they want to improve women's ability to understand and know their body and to be able to make really confident decisions around, you know, spacing children. So so what great news for all of us. Oh, such good news. Oh my gosh, Teresa. And it's such, so important for women to have community too, when doing this, it's so important. I mean, think about the olden days when we lived in villages and breastfed each other's children. Like We were talking about our fertility with our friends. It might've been taboo with the men or whatever that was like back when, but I mean, this community is important. And, um, I think that's what I think about too. When I, as you know, Teresa and listeners, like I'm training women to become hormone coaches. And that's more of like the hormone health doula, like the, I'm going to journey with you. I'm going to help you understand what doc questions to ask your doctors. I'm going to help you get to the root of some of these cycle issues that you're having. So not necessarily to avoid or to achieve pregnancy, but just health related in general, but either way, like to have that support sister with you, um, is so important and to have a fertility awareness instructor with you rather than just this isolated, you know, solitary thing. Again, some people are cool with that, but if there is a goal you have, you have a goal of achieving, you have a goal of avoiding, or you have a goal to get to the root of why your cycles suck mm -hmm. <laughs> on a scale of one to suck. it suck like terrible. <laughs> then I just want to encourage you to reach out to someone who knows so that you are not alone in this because it can be lonely. Yeah, that's a great way to sum up this episode, Jamie. Um, thank you. And I um, will see you the next time we get together and we'll continue to empower women with the genius of their own hormone. Thanks for listening to the Hormone Genius Podcast. Please remember to share our podcast with your friends and family and also follow us on social media. If you were not aware, we have a YouTube channel. So if you could like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay in the loop with all of our latest episodes, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support. We are excited to journey alongside you as you discover the beauty and the genius of your hormones.